number 10 spot we have the Vatican Library. The Vatican Library is a very secret library closed to the public. The only people that have access to it are popes and people that have gone through a lengthy screening process and even then they need to know exactly what they are wanting information on and will only be given info on what they ask for. This library is the top secret library with history and documentation since the beginning of time. The amount of dark gossip that is within those walls I'm sure is exponential. <laughs> from the little that we know, the Vatican Library holds letters from world leaders throughout history detailing major events that us little guys will probably never be privy to. I'm sure they even have documentation on alien sightings. The church refuses to talk about what they have and know and it's really just a shame. I'm a history lover myself and truly that would be a magical experience to be able to explore this library. Ah well. If you like this video don't forget to subscribe to be recommended more content like this. In our number 9 spot we have Operation Snow White. On June 20th 1977 Michael Meisner a Scientologist contacted the FBI after allegedly being held captive for months. He revealed that he was a part of the biggest infiltration of the US government in history in something called Operation Snow White. On July 8th 1977 156 FBI agents entered a Scientology center in LA in the largest FBI raid in history. It was discovered that 5,000 Scientology agents infiltrated the IRS, the US Coast Guard Intelligence, DEA, etc. There were bugged offices, planted false information, stolen files, and so much more found. Apparently the goal of this initiative was to remove any bad reports about Scientology. Some of the founders were sentenced to a few years in jail because of these crimes. They definitely want you to forget about this, but I'm sure they have done it again and I'm sure other churches and organizations have done the same thing. We just haven't heard about it and perhaps they haven't been caught. In our number 8 spot we have exorcisms. This one shocked me. I knew that priests could do exorcisms but I didn't realize that this is something that they do much. <laughs> I truly thought that exorcisms were done more often in the movies to young girls doing the crab walk down the stairs. Yeesh, thinking of that scene gives me the shivers. Anyways, apparently the Vatican had a chief exorcist named Father Gabriel Amorth who had served over 60 years to the church and had performed over 160,000 exorcisms. Um, excuse me? <laughs> wow. How have there been that many people infiltrated by demons and this info isn't more widely talked about? Also, that is just this guy's number. Apparently popes and priests around the world perform exorcisms all the time. I'm shooketh. <laughs> I could understand that the church wouldn't want to talk about this because it is a private, very sad thing to happen to a person, but man, that's a lot of people walking around feeling like they have demons within them. Pretty scary. In our number 7 spot we have His Holiness. His Holiness was a book that was released to the public in 2012 which is based on the secret leaked papers about Pope Benedict. Apparently the private documents were leaked by the Pope's butler. Yikes. Apparently after an investigation it was discovered that the individuals who were not from the Vatican were blackmailing gay bishops because they had broken their celibacy vows. The Pope went on to resign after these documents became public. Well this is definitely a scandal that's for sure. I remember people talking about this when it was happening but I don't remember hearing the church comment on it. But I guess they sort of did through their actions and I'm sure Pope Benedict was encouraged to resign. In our number 6 spot we have the dead man on trial. This is a little piece of history that truly terrifies me and is such an testament to those times. In 897 AD a literal dead man was put on trial. The man had been dead for 7 months. He had been dressed for the occasion by someone whom I'm sure was traumatized afterward. His name was Pope Formosus. He was being put Put on trial for acts that he had committed in his life. He had a lawyer and everything. He was found guilty and stripped of his former title as Pope and everything he formerly did was declared void. His body was stripped of his clothes and put into rags before he was thrown into a river. The Tiber River in Italy. Specifically because this river was where a lot of criminals bodies were disposed of. Pretty gross. I wonder if there are any ghost haunting stories from this river. I bet you there are. In our number 5 spot we have the Vatican 
bank. The Vatican Bank has had its fair share of scandals over the years and you best believe that the church will not be bringing any attention to it by speaking about it in any way. Allegedly to start off the scandals, it is said that the Vatican Bank received a church tax from Germany's leader during World War II, if you catch my drift. Also allegedly a large amount of money was paid to the IOR so that the western banks couldn't track the Vatican's spending. Hmm. The details have never Ever been released to the public, so Lord knows where they put their money. <laughs> but why would you want to hide your money in the first place? Perhaps so that no one would know what you're up to if you're up to no good, but also possibly because someone might be a threat and that might be a reason to shield what you're doing. Either way, the secrecy is questionable. In our number 4 spot we have mental illness in the church. When researching for this video, one of the things that shocked me was the amount of people that spoke about how the churches do not handle mental illness very well. You would assume that it would be approached with love and compassion and guidance to get help. But the common theme is that people have been told to just pray and it will make the illness go away. Some believe that this thought process stems from the very old thinking that mental illness stems from demons being in one's body and so people are being told to pray them away because that's what was always done if someone needed you know, an exorcism or to get rid of an attached spirit. The biggest problem is that issues go untalked about, the people bottle it up inside and when prayer doesn't work, the person dealing with the mental illness feels like a failure or like they don't have an enough faith. Hopefully this is something that churches of all religions work on improving as this is just unacceptable at this point in time. In our number 3 spot we have shame. Within many religions there has been the problem of spiritual criticism which has led to emotional harm within the church communities. I'm not talking about outsiders passing judgement, I'm talking about religious community members passing judgements on each other. This bad behaviour is committed under the banner of spirituality. From practices of shaming members if they don't fulfil religious expectations to bad mouthing members who have left, making people want to stay out of fear. Scientologists have been accused of doing that to members that have tried to leave, but also other churches have been accused of this as well. It's super unfortunate to hear that in communities that have you know, the core purpose of being loving, they are people that are shaming each other. Talk about not practicing what you preach. In our number 2 spot we have misusing their power. In recent years it has become public knowledge that the French clergy took advantage of more than 200,000 individuals since the 1950s, mainly males. The Catholic Church has been accused of turning a blind eye to this happening and many have been outraged that this went on for so long without someone stepping in. Allegedly it wasn't until the 2000s that some progress was made, before that the church showed complete indifference to the victims. Through a series of investigations, 2,700 victims gave testimonies about what happened to them and thousands were identified through archives. A wide range study showed that there could be up to 330,000 victims. In recent years about 2,900 to 3,200 priests have become suspects to these crimes. Wow. Truly despicable. I hope that there is some kind of justice for these victims. In our number 1 spot we have the Salem witch trials. Most people believe that the witch trials were a result of many things. Bad weather, a poor government, and paranoid leaders. But what a lot of people may not be aware of is the idea that the Catholic and Protestant churches possibly used the trials to compete with each other for followers. Pretty dark. History.com reported that economists Peter Leeson and Jacob Russ believe that, quote, the two churches advertised their finesse at persecuting witches as proof that they were the best church to join if you wanted protection from Satan. Witches, after all, were doing the bidding of Satan, so getting rid of them was a way to protect people from them. Wow. Well, that will definitely persuade one or two people, that's for sure. It has also been noted that the Catholic Church did not fear or acknowledge witches in history until the Protestant church became a competitor threat. Number 10. Royal Air Force Squadron This photo, taken in 1919, was first published in 1975 by Sir Victor Goddard, a retired RFA officer. The photo is a group portrait of Victor's squadron, which had served in World War I at the HMS Daedalus training facility. This isn't a normal photo though, as an extra ghostly face appears in the photo. In the back of the airman positioned on the top row, fourth from the left, you can clearly see the face of another man. 
Right. It's said to be the face of Freddie Jackson, an air mechanic who had accidentally died from an airplane propeller two days earlier. And let me just mention, his funeral had taken place on the day this photograph was taken. Members of the squadron easily recognized the face as Freddie's. I mean, it was his funeral, he just wanted to be a part of the photo. It has also been suggested that Freddie, unaware of his death, decided to show up for the group photo, which is just sad. Number 9. Combremere Abbey Library In 1891, Cybele Corbett took a photo of the Combremere Abbey Library in Cheshire, England. Cybele was an amateur photographer who allegedly set up her camera and took this hour-long exposure while at the funeral of her brother-in-law, Lord Combremere, was taking place four miles from the home. When the plate was developed, the transparent image of a man sitting in one of the library chairs was noticed. Many of the staff said the image looked like the late second Viscount and the apparition happened to be sitting in Lord Combremere's favorite chair. So, you know, it's obviously him. It's thought by some that a servant might have come into the room and sat briefly in the chair, thus creating the image, but this idea was refuted by members of Lord Combremere's household. Lord Combremere's father, the first Viscount, had been involved in a mysterious incident himself years earlier while serving as governor of Barbados when he had the chase vault opened and carefully examined in search of an explanation for the moving coffins. There. Seems like him and his father have both had some paranormal experiences, both in life and death. Number 8. The Watcher of Carabri Rock The rock formation near Alice Springs, Australia, known as Carabri Rock, is made of dolomite that was formed more than 800 million years ago, and it's considered a sacred site by the Arenta Aboriginal people. With that much history behind it and that much importance assigned to it, it makes sense that there's someone or something that looks over it. That's why the spirit is called the Watcher of Carabri Rock. Now, no one really knows exactly who or what it is, but one photo of it dates back to the 1950s. In either 1956 or 1959, reports vary, a minister from Adelaide snapped the photo during a visit to the rock formation, and it's been puzzling people ever since. According to the minister, Reverend R. Ed Lance, there was no one around when the photograph was taken, however, but when he developed it, the ghostly figure now seen in the image appeared. It's kind of nice to know that there's something taking care and watching over that area. No? Number 7. Leeds General Infirmary Now, why wouldn't there be a creepy ghost photo taken in a hospital? With many patients' lives ending and beginning there, those places are full of spirits. Now, this photo isn't an extremely well-known ghost photo, but it's still creepy nonetheless. This photo was taken at Leeds General Infirmary by Andrew Milburn. The photo shows what appears to be a ghost nurse or patient fleeing into a room in a hospital corridor. Andrew took the photo to show his girlfriend where he was in the hospital, and and did not mean to capture a ghost. He didn't know this ghost was in the photo until he reviewed it more closely. Andrew had always been skeptical about ghosts, but seeing this figure changed his mind, and honestly, that would change my mind too. Number 6. Whaley House Known worldwide as the most haunted house in America, the Whaley House is recognized for its historical significance in Old Town San Diego. They do haunted tours on the property, and this family went on a tour and got their photo taken. In the photo, you can see the brown outline line of someone or something in between the two adults. Now, there are multiple people this could be. One of the most infamous ghosts in San Diego is the spirit of Yankee Jim Robinson. Yankee Jim was hanged in the house in 1852 after being convicted of stealing horses. Thomas Whaley himself, who owned and lived in the house with his families years later, had said they could hear heavy footsteps going up and down the stairs. Visitors have reported cold spots and the feeling of their chest and throat tightening while in the home. Others claim to have seen Yankee Jim too, and apparition that appears and disappears when you get close. This ghost in the photo could also be Thomas Whaley himself. Today, and for many years, visitors of the house have reported seeing Thomas. One guest waved to a man she said she saw standing in the parlor. No one else could see the man, but when asked what he looked like, she described a man wearing period clothing that resembled Thomas. Adults too have seen him wearing a frock coat and pantaloons standing on the second story landing. And others have seen his wife, Anna, usually floating about in the garden or in the downstairs room. Her ghost which appears white and billowy, seems to just drift about and then disappears. So with so much ghost activity in that house, I am sure it's one of those spirits. Number 5. Tantalon Castle Tantalon Castle dates back to the 14th century, stands on a remote headland near North Berwick, and was badly damaged in an attack by Oliver Cromwell's forces in 1651. A photo taken there shows a ghostly figure. The photo, taken by Christopher Anachin in 2009, still remains an unsolved mystery. 
history. It's a photo of a man in what appears to be 16th century clothes. It's known that no mannequins or cost guides are used within the castle, and experts have confirmed through analysis that there is no digital alterations at play. Even skeptics have been left baffled by the image after tests confirmed no technological trickery is at play. Psychologist Professor Richard Wiseman from the University of Hertfordshire, who studied the picture, said the figure appears to be in a period costume, but we know 100% that the Tantalan castle is not the sort of place that has mannequins or costume guides. Seems like an old spirit just wanted to take a look outside. Number 4. Nottingham Galleries of Justice One of the best ghostly sightings caught on film is this spooky black figure photographed by Simon Brown, who is a qualified parapsychologist. He was spending the day at the old Galleries of Justice with his brother and was simply taking photographs of the building. Although Simon says he didn't notice anything while taking the images, when he downloaded them onto his computer, he noticed what appeared to be a black figure shadow that seemed to have walked through a brick wall. Staff at the galleries have corroborated Simon's story, saying that they too have seen similar figures and have experienced similar paranormal encounters, but have not yet been able to capture anything on film. They've seen ghostly apparitions, dealt with poltergeist activity, and had doors slam on their own. Simon also mentioned when discussing the figure that it appeared to be in turn of the century prisoner dress, dragging a leg behind him as though he was in chains. All I can say is creepy. Number 3. New Home Buying a new house is a fun and exciting time, but what if you bought a house that you didn't know was haunted? Seems like that's what happened to Michelle midwinter. Michelle had bought a new house in England and she took a photo of it to send to her friends and family. She'd gone outside, snapped a photo, and returned to the inside of the house when she noticed a face staring back at her in the bottom right window of the house. I'm sorry, when, when you zoom in, you can clearly see a nose, eyes, and shoulders, and the face of a man staring back at you. Now, now, Michelle didn't pack up her bags and leave right away, which I'll never understand. Instead, she posted the image online and it was eventually contacted by a historian local in her area who believed that the apparition in the image could have been a man known as Old Man Kent, who was thought to be a suspect in a death back in 1860. Initially, Michelle dismissed the image as nothing more than reflections and refractions of light from the flowers outside her window, but following further paranormal sightings and activity within the house, such as cold spots and lights flickering, it seems like Michelle is now a believer. I can't believe having to live in a house like that. Number 2. Bedroom Ghost In 2005, a teenage girl had just gotten her first digital camera. She was messing around, experimenting with the features, and taking photos of her friend Tommy. The two photos were taken seconds apart. The first was taken with flash, and the second was taken without. When taking the photo, the photographer and her friend were the only people in the room at the time, but there's clearly another person in the photo on the right. It looks like an older person wearing glasses, and I mean, there's clearly someone there. The girl said that unusual things were always happening in our family's house as there were noises and things moved. Maybe it was the spirit who was doing all this and decided to reveal themselves. If I took a photo of a ghost in my bedroom though, I would never sleep there again. And coming in at number 1 is the ghost in the water. In 2014, Kim Davidson was swimming in a lake with a friend and their combined three children. They went to Murphy's Hole in Lockhart River in Queensland, Australia. While there, they took a photograph. Normal. Right? But when the photograph came out, there was a ghostly figure of a girl behind the group who looked like she'd been leering behind the family. They said that there was nothing in between them when the photo was taken, and on close examining the image, they realized it was a white face with dark eyes and two horns on either side of the head. Its fingers are on Kim's shoulder and on the small girl's right arm. Kim posted it on Facebook, and upon seeing the image, many comments were made, some saying that the two horns looked like two ponytails or buns. A fellow user shared the story of Doreen O'Sullivan, a girl who accidentally drowned in the same creek in the same spot in 1913. Her obituary was found in the Brisbane Courier, dated the 22nd of November 1913. The notice reads that Doreen O'Sullivan, aged 13 years, the oldest daughter of Mr. James O'Sullivan, was accidentally drowned whilst bathing in the Lockyer Creek on Friday afternoon. Nearly an hour elapsed before the body was recovered. Now, the spot, which has always been considered dangerous, is known as Murphy's Hole and is over 20 feet deep. Upon reading this, Kim recollected that they had experienced strange things that day while they were swimming in water. She felt someone's presence behind her, but she ignored it. Twice, someone in the water even grabbed her elder daughter's leg. 
This made Kim believe in the presence of a spirit in the water. By looking at the picture, she was convinced that the unknown face was that of Doreen. Kim got two paranormal experts to check out the photo, and after investigating the photograph carefully, they concluded that the shape of the image was that of a child. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have a bees the boo. This fallen angel is described in the Testament of Solomon. He is said to be one of the angels that followed Beelzebub upon his fall from heaven. He is the sin of pride and is known for his ability to lead people astray. He is most easily summoned in the month of July during the fifth hour of the night. After his fall from grace, he was left with only one red wing and was condemned to hell. A beast the Boo is said to have control over the imprisoned souls of the underworld and he plays a primary role in the demon world. A beast the Boo himself claims that he was once an angel in what is referred to as the first heaven and after his fall he began to roam Egypt. It is said that he was caught in the collapsing of the Red Sea which left him crushed and subsequently imprisoned in a pillar of water. But despite this seal, Beelzebub claimed that quote, when he is ready, then he will come in triumph. In our number 9 spot today we have Bail. Before I dive into this one guys, please don't forget to hit that like button, it really helps us out. Bail is ranked as the first of the Ars Gotia and he is the principal king of hell. It is said that he governs somewhere from 66 to 250 legions of demons and spirits, so he's clearly a workaholic in the darkest sense. In grimoire tradition, it is said that Bail appears in the forms of a man, a cat, a toad, or different combinations of those with the appearance of a king or soldier, but with the heads of these creatures and on a set of spider legs. So I'm just saying, the guy's not easy to miss. I feel like that's pretty clear exactly who that is. In our number eight spot today, we have Samael. Samael is an archangel whose name means the venom of God, the poison of God, or the blindness of God. He's not just any old archangel, however, he is the archangel of death. This means that he, of course, has taken lives under the orders of God. It is said that his method of doing this is confronting those he's been told to kill with his sword drawn. On the tip of the sword is a poison so that when the target gets cut, this wound may not kill them, but the poison will ensure a slow and painful death. Pretty dark. Right? In Hebrew lore, Samael is the prince of demons and the executioner for the death sentences handed out by God, and he is also known as the seducer. This is because he doesn't just kill people, he seduces them into sin, and then once they've sinned, he then gets instructed to kill them. It's like a weird sort of gaslighting situation. In our number seven spot today, we have Amon. Amon is the great marquis of hell, and he is the seventh of the demons in the Ars Gotia. It is said that he is in charge of governing 40 different legions of demons, but his favorite thing to do with humans is making them fall in love with each other. He is also known to settle debates, and you might be sitting there thinking that this guy actually sounds pretty cool and nice, but despite these cool and nice things he can do and enjoys doing, he is anything but nice. Just like he can make people fall in love, he can do the exact opposite as well. He can cause people to turn against each other and can even will someone to harm the innocent, which is terrifying. To make that thought slightly less horrifying, it is said that he doesn't usually do this for no reason and usually only does this when attacked or if someone is standing in his way of completing a mission. Still not good, but I suppose that's a little better than just random acts of violence. It is said that Amon appears as a wolf with a snake's tail and that he possesses the ability to breathe fire. Or sometimes he will appear as a man with dog teeth who is inside of a raven. I don't know. Ask him about that one, not me. In our number six spot today, we have Belphegor. Belphegor is a fallen angel, and after his fall from heaven, he has now become the demon lord presiding over the sin of sloth. It is said that Belphegor served as a lieutenant from hell. He was sent to earth on a mission by Satan. While he was on earth, he grew quite fond of Paris, France, and it is said that because of this affinity, he now lurks deep within the catacombs under the city. Belphegor can be invoked by mortals who are wishing to find fame and wealth, usually through as little effort as possible. But these wishes are of course doomed to fail because of the demon's true mission to lure the dreamers into sloth. Through the failure of whatever was provided to the dreamer by Belphegor, he then draws them into procrastination and idle dreaming rather than the act of production, which then condemns them to a life of failure. Belphegor is also recognized as one of the seven great kings who rule over hell. In our number five spot today, we have Lucifer. Lucifer was an angel before he fell from grace. In the book of Isaiah, it says, quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Lucifer is now the ruler of hell, and he commands an entire army of sinners and demons, and he even tried to organize an uprising against God. So I think it's pretty clear exactly why he is a terrifying entity. He 
also uses his power to send terrible people to Earth in order to terrorize everyone, as well as to try and tempt non-sinners into the dark side. It is said that Lucifer also might just be the one who is responsible for the original sins that were seen in the Garden of Eden. Some believe that he is the snake who placed the temptation. In our number 4 spot today we have Beelzebub. Beelzebub is a former seraph who turned into a high ranking demon. He is one of the princes of hell and also oversees the order of the fly. He, Satan and Lucifer form the triarchy of hell which makes him one of the supreme monarchs of the underworld. As a seraphim he was under the archangel Gabriel but he was one of the very first angels to fall. Beelzebub is often confused with Satan and while the two names can technically be interchanged, they are two separate entities and in some writings they even disagree at times. Beelzebub is associated with pride and gluttony and he has also been held responsible for demonic possessions throughout the years. Unfortunately, flies are a very important thing for him as it is said that he can take the form of flies. Now his main job is to rule over the fallen angels as well as all the demons that are originally from hell. In our number 3 spot today we have Asmodeus. Asmodeus is the king of demons and earthly spirits and is often referred to as one of the seven princes of hell. He also represents one of the seven deadly sins, lust. Before becoming a demon in his former life he was an angel who was known as Asmodel, the angel of April and patience who rules the zodiac sign Taurus. But of course we are here to talk about his demon form which is said to appear either as a ruthless brutal monster or as a kind of mischievous demon that is playful and quick thinking. Honestly I'm not sure which form would be worse to encounter. The monster would be scary but a little annoying demon would be the worst. For the most terrifying exit I've ever heard of it is said that Asmodeus will cut himself into pieces and immediately after disappear. In our number 2 spot today we have Azazel. Azazel is one of the chief governors of the Gregori, which is a group of fallen angel who married female mortals which then produced the Nephilim which were these scary giant creatures that ate mortals. In the beginning Azazel started as an eater of sins but the more sins he consumed the hungrier he became and this led to him not being satiated by the sins he was receiving. The reason he was cast from heaven is because he taught men how to make swords, knives, shields and breastplates which then led to humans being corrupted and thinking that they were invincible. It is said that the humans went so far that they were planning to raid heaven and this is when God told Raphael to bind Azazel's hands and feet, open up a hole in the desert and toss him in, casting him into darkness. This worked and for a long time Azazel remained in prison. It was so bad that the jagged rocks near him tore his physical body away and this left him as a mass of darkness covered in mouth and eyes. Later freed by Lucifer, he went on to join the demons in hell. In our number 1 spot today we have Azbeel. Asbeel had to be included on this list today if for any reason because his name literally means God forsaken or God deserter. Asbeel appears in the book of Enoch and is the angel of ruin and one of the fallen angels from the Gregory. After leaving the angelic post and straying from the angelic duties, Asbeel dedicated his life to leading humanity astray. Asbeel completely abandoned God and his grace and wishes nothing from him. Asbeel believes that God is basically just another common celestial who has hoarded all of the power at the expense of the rest of creation. During and after his fall, Asbeel questioned why God wouldn't just completely remove any evil and malice in the hearts of his creations. And this led to him believing that God was a tyrant who only cared about worship and praise. Number 10, SS Watertown. In December 1924, James Courtney and Michael Meehan were crew members on the SS Watertown. They were cleaning a cargo tank of the oil tanker and they were overcome by gas fumes, which resulted in both of their deaths. Due to this, the crew buried them at sea, but to their astonishment, the ghostly faces of the soldiers appeared in the water the next day. Yeah, like in the waves. Later on, many other crew members reported seeing the faces as well. The faces were so visible that the captain of the ship ordered them to take a picture of them to have for proof, you know, so people didn't think that they were crazy. And this was smart because if someone told me they saw faces of two dead men in the water, I would probably never talk to them again and think that they were cuckoo. Although, in the picture you can clearly see two faces which is just plain creepy. When the SS Watertown returned to land, the negative was even checked for fakery and proclaimed genuine. So yeah, just two faces chilling in the waves, 
no big deal. Number nine, the nurse. This photo was taken in an abandoned tuberculosis hospital in Louisville, Kentucky called Waverly Hills Sanatorium in 2006. As you can imagine, many people passed away here and it's rumored to be filled with paranormal activity. In recent years, it has become one of America's most popular destinations for ghost hunters. This image depicts a woman just standing to the right side, but when the photo was taken, no one was there. It was a ghost. It has been agreed among the paranormal community that the photo depicts Mary Lee, a nurse who took her own life in the hospital. The story goes this poor woman was impregnated by a doctor who worked in the hospital but later wanted nothing to do with her. Nowadays she wanders the halls of the hospital and interacts with ghost hunters. Number 8. Tulip Staircase Reverend Ralph Hardy, a retired clergyman from White Rock, British Columbia, took this famous photograph in 1966. Originally he only wanted to take a picture of the elegant tulip Tulip staircase in the Queen's House section of the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England. And I mean, I don't blame him, they're pretty. But upon development, the photo revealed a shrouded figure climbing the stairs. It's strange and unsettling, and Ralph said there was no one else in the frame when he took it. Experts who examined the original negative concluded that it had not been tampered with. The vicinity of the staircase is rumored to be haunted, and unexplained footsteps have often been heard there, so it's most likely something supernatural who just wanted their photo taken. Number 7. The Brown Lady The Brown Lady of Raynham Hall is a ghost that reportedly haunts Raynham Hall in Norfolk, England. It became one of the most famous hauntings in the United Kingdom when photographers from Country Life magazine claimed to have captured its image. According to the legend, the Proud Lady is the ghost of Dorothy Walpole, the sister of Robert Walpole, generally regarded as the first Prime Minister of Great Britain. She was the second wife of Charles Townshend, second Viscount Townshend, who was notorious for his violent temper. The story goes that when Charles discovered that his wife had committed adultery with Lord Wharton, he punished her by locking her in her rooms in the family home, Random Hall. According to Mary Wortley Montagu, Dorothy was in fact entrapped by the Countess of Wharton. She invited Dorothy over to stay for a few days, knowing that her husband would never allow her to leave, not even to see her children. She remained at the Random Hall until her death in 1726 from smallpox. This is just an extremely sad story and I can't imagine her pain. The first sighting of the brown lady was in 1835 and the photograph was taken in 1936. Number 6 falling through the ceiling. Back in the 1950s, the Cooper family from Texas moved into their new house. Once there, they took a family photo, which seems normal, right? Well, not for them. When the picture was developed, the image of a body falling from the ceiling was clearly visible. To be clear, no one fell from the ceiling when they took the photo, so what happened? As further investigation on the story has brought no plausible explanation, there exist many speculations, including one that argues that the shadow is the ghost of the previous owner of the house, but my question is why is he falling from the ceiling and why did he have to ruin that beautiful family photo? I remember seeing this photo on the internet when I was probably too young to see it, and after all these years, this image still gives me chills. Ugh. Number 5 backseat ghost. On March 22nd, 1959, Mabel Chinnery and her husband drove to the graveyard in which her mother had been buried. Her mother had died a week previously and they were going to take photos of her grave, and they did. As Mabel returned to the car, she decided to use her last remaining shot to take a candid picture of her husband waiting in the vehicle on the passenger side. Nothing was out of the ordinary, it was just a random photo, but when the pictures were developed, one of Mabel's friends pointed out that someone believed to be her mother mother appeared to be behind her husband in the back seat of the car. Now was the figure her mother or some other spirit? Who knows? I mean they were in a graveyard, it could have been anyone or anything. The photograph itself wasn't seen in the United States until the story got a whole page in the Sunday newspaper. Mabel stated that the spot where the unexpected figure appeared in the back of the car is where her mother always sat when they went for drives, so it makes sense that it could be her. An unnamed photo expert is quoted as saying, the lady in the back can't be the result of a double exposure. If it were, the doors upright wouldn't block off part of her face, and she can't be a reflection in the window either. So maybe it really is Mabel's mother. Number four, Wem Ghost. 
On November 19, 1995, Wem Town Hall burned to the ground in Wem Shropshire, located in England. During the fire, Tony O'Rahilly, a sewage farm worker who was also an amateur photographer, was originally stopped by police from approaching the burning building. He took a picture of the blaze from across the street with a 200 millimeter lens. It appeared to depict the image of a young girl in the doorway of the burning building. Now, to be clear, there were no injuries or fatalities from the fire. This was not a human. Locals who saw the photo believed it was the ghost of Jane Cherm, a young girl who was accused in 1677 of starting a fire in the same town. The image of the girl in the doorway of the burning building was not noticed by Tony, the photographer, or the onlookers. It only appeared after the photo had been developed. I mean, if she was accused of starting a fire and then she popped back up in an area where another fire started, it seems like it really could be Jane. Number three, the specter of Newby Church. The specter of Newby Church is the name given to a figure in the photograph taken in the Church of Christ the Consoler on the grounds of Newby Hall in North Yorkshire, United Kingdom. The image was taken in 1963 by the Reverend Kenneth F. Lord. As the figure appears to resemble a human, much speculation has been had regarding what type of person might be in the image. Most speculation by believers has concluded that it resembles a 16th century monk with a white shroud over his face, possibly to mask leprosy or another disfigurement. Others believe it looks like a plague doctor from the 16th and 17th centuries. Initial claims suggest that the figure would measure at 9 feet tall, but its feet are not visible, so it could easily be standing on a box, giving the impression of height. Some people thought the photo was due to double exposure, but photographic experts have concluded that the image is not the result of double exposure. So what was it, and why was it in a church? No one truly knows, but it's extremely frightening. What does it look like to you? Let me know in the comments. Number 2. Mystery Guest On January 22nd, 1985, the Conventry Freeman organization and their guests stood in prayer during a dinner event. All the guests are still, and as it was a dark room, the photographer probably thought it would be the perfect time to allow for a longer than usual exposure to get enough light into the picture. Makes sense. Now, nothing was out of the ordinary at the time, but as people started to see the print of the picture, a mystery surfaced. Who was the robed figure standing near the end of one of the tables? No one had dressed up for the event, and no one remembers anyone standing there as they stood for prayer. The figure also seems to be taking part in the prayer, head slightly bowed, hands clasped in front. St. Mary's Commentary, Warwickshire, is where the event was hosted. It has many legends of ghosts and paranormal activity, but I wonder why this being decided to join in prayer. It just gives me bad vibes like evil lurks within it. And coming in at number one is The Young Boy. One of the most famous haunted houses in the United States is the Dutch Colonial House at 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. The haunting stems from the night of November 13th, 1974, when 23 year old Ronald Defoe ended the lives of all six members of his family. He was then arrested, convicted, and given six concurrent life sentences. In December, of 1975, George and Kathy Lutz, along with their three children, moved into the house and claimed that spooky things were happening. For example, George would wake up at 3.15 every morning, which was the approximate time that Ronald committed his crimes. Kathy said she would feel a ghostly presence and be embraced by it. All of this and more caused the family to flee in fear after only staying in the house for 28 days and, honestly, I don't blame them. Due to this, demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren visited the house and set up time-lapse infrared cameras and caught this photo. The picture wasn't made public until three years later when George Lutz appeared on the Merv Griffith show in 1979. Believers of the haunting think that the picture is the ghost of the youngest Defoe son, John Matthew, who was nine at the time. Others believed it's a staged photo, but despite its controversy, this picture is one of the most frightening images from the Amityville horror. Starting off this countdown, we have Pope Boniface face the eighth. This dude was the definition of corrupt and disgusting. So he was the head of the Catholic Church from 1294 until his death in 1303. Let's just say that he did not practice what the church was preaching. This dude was known to take advantage of a number of young men. In response, he said that it was as natural as rubbing one hand against the other. So he said taking advantage of the young was totally fine. Not only that, but one time he got it on with a married woman and her daughter. I know. 
it's gross. In our ninth spot, we have simony. Simony is something that was practiced around the Middle Ages. It's the act of buying your way into church offices. This became a huge problem in the 9th and 10th century. So basically, the church was selling positions in the office. This allowed people who had money to become clergy members. Half the time, they weren't even educated and couldn't even read or didn't know how to perform ordinary religious services. But what the church only cared about was money. In 1487, the Pope sold 24 offices, and people were outraged because unqualified people were becoming bishops or cardinals. The church would also do this with religious items. They would sell them for tons of money and people would foolishly buy them from the church. In our 8th spot, we have the Pittsburgh priests. A couple of years ago, it was revealed that 6 Pennsylvania priests routinely took advantage of a number of individuals over the course of several decades. One disturbing report claims that they made a young man pose like Christ on the cross while they photographed him doing so. The photos were then sent to a number of other priests. The total amount of priests accused are 300. This is absolutely disgusting and I feel so bad for the innocent victims that were taken advantage of. In our seventh spot, we have ignoring the situation. When Pope Francis heard the story that I just mentioned, you know what he had to say? He said, and I quote, most of these cases belong in the past. Meaning, hey, thanks for coming forward, but let's move on from the past and ignore everything that happened. He continued on saying, and I quote, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. He said that after it was revealed how many priests were found guilty. Now people weren't happy by him saying this because first off, he's never going to feel the same suffering as the victims, and second, he's more worried about how bad this makes the church look rather than bringing justice for the victims. In our sixth spot, we have hiding the past. People are incredibly furious how the Pope handled all of the allegations made against the priests. The right thing for him to do would be allow criminal authorities to access the church records worldwide so they can try and get justice for all the victims and get rid of the men taking advantage of their power and position. But of course, he won't allow that, nor will the other men who run the church. Instead, it's let's keep it all hush hush and hope no other victims come forward. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the years of cover-ups. Back in 2018, it was revealed that Bishop Juan Barros of Chile was accused of covering up clerical abuse for years. The bishop denied, saying he never knew about this, but one of the victims say that he was there when one of the incidents happened and bore witness to it all and then did nothing. For years, this bishop covered up several incidences and protected the perpetrators. This just makes me sick. After being called out though, he did resign. Coming in at number 4, we have the punishments for disobeying. Bishop Gonzalo Duarte Garcia de Cortazar is another member of the Catholic Church that used his power to take advantage of a number of individuals. There were reports of him doing this all the way back to 1992. Back in 1992, he publicly slapped a student because the student refused to kiss him on the lips. In fact, this was common. If the students wouldn't do as he told them to, they would be slapped or punished. And Bishop Juan Barros was responsible for covering this all up, so word wouldn't get out. Coming in at number 3, we have the slush funds. The church has also been known to do sketchy and illegal things with their money, such as move Vatican money through slush funds across Europe. On top of that, they used $250 million of the church's money to invest in the luxury London apartments, which ultimately tanked. They even contemplated investing hundreds of millions of dollars into oil fields. This money was supposed to support palpal charities. They also have a history of embezzlement, fraud, and money laundering. How great is that? Of course though, they'll always get away with it because they're the church. Moving on to number 2, we have the ties with Hitler. Did you know that during World War II, the church actually made a deal with Hitler? Yeah, the deal allowed the dictator to increase his power in Germany without interference from the church if he promised to basically leave the church alone. So instead of standing up to him and the horrors that he was committing, they turned a blind eye and were like, leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. On top of that, in 1939, on the dictator's 50th birthday, they flew not flags for him. Then, they actually received tons of money from him, but used the IOR to hide this, so it wouldn't look like they profited from their relationship with the dictator, when in fact, we all know that they did. And in our number one spot today, we have the Catholic clergy in France. Just this year, it was found that Catholic clergy members in France took advantage of over 216,000 individuals over the past seven decades. Again, that is absolutely disgusting. 
On top of that, a report found that the church prioritized its own protection, so it told the victims to stay silent. It said that between 29,000 to 32,000 predators worked in the French Catholic Church between 1950 to 2020. The report also found, and I quote, the church's attitude could be summarized as one of concealment, relativization, or even denial, with only a very recent recognition dating from 2015. The Catholic Church's immediate reaction was to protect itself as an institution, and it has shown complete, even cruel indifference to those having suffered. Starting off this countdown, we have absolving sins with money. Basically, back in the day, the Catholic Church told people that they could absolve their sins and get a ticket to heaven if they just paid them. Like you were paying the church for forgiveness. Sorry, that's not how these things work. It also got to the point where people were paying for future sins. Not only that, they claimed that for a fee, relatives could get their deceased loved ones out of purgatory. And people fell for this all. Not only that, but poor people thought that they were screwed. They're like, if we sin, it's over. We can't afford to pay to get our sins forgiven. I wouldn't be surprised if the rich went around committing crimes and killing people than being like, here's some cash, I'm all good now, thanks. In our ninth spot, we have imprisoning Galileo. In 1663, Galileo was like, science is greater than God. He also said that the sun was the center of the universe and claimed that the earth moved around it. I mean, he was on to something there, but just, you know, he was slightly off. Anyways, the church didn't like these claims because it conflicted with the teachings of the church. So they imprisoned him. He was imprisoned in his home for years. I mean, they threatened him with torture, imprisonment, and even being burned at the stake. So let's just say he got off easy compared to those other punishments. It wasn't until 350 years later did the church be like, okay, yes, we agree, Galileo was on to something. Moving on to number eight, we have cutting funding. For years, the church gave thousands of dollars to a nonprofit organization, Companeros, that would help Hispanic immigrants get access to health care, among other things. That was until they found out that Companeros supported a gay and lesbian rights group. So the church cut the funding to this company for their connection to the LGBTQ2S plus community. They're not the only group that the church has done this to, though. No, apparently, and I quote, since 2010, nine groups from across the country have lost financing from the campaign because of conflicts with Catholic principles. Moving on to number seven, we have the gay clergy member. In 2018, a secret Catholic group came forward claiming they had information all about their clergy member, Monsignor Jeffrey Burrell. They claimed that he was using the gay male dating app Grindr and would visit gay bars weekly. Now, let me just say, there's nothing wrong with being gay. What's wrong is shaming this poor man and outing him. And the poor man had to resign. Obviously, this is something the Catholic Church doesn't want us to know. Why? Because they say homosexual acts is immoral and contrary to the natural law. They also say homosexual tendencies are objectively disordered. And they also preach celibacy. So having a clergy member that is gay is highly controversial for them. And they try to hide it. A lot of Catholics were outraged when word got out. Scariest part is how they found out about Jeffrey in the first place. Apparently the group was tracking his movements based on the apps he was using. Pretty terrifying and also very, very wrong. Moving on to number six, we have Joan of Arc. Turns out that the church wasn't the biggest fan of Joan of Arc. In fact, at one point she was pretty much the Catholic church's number one public enemy. Long story short, she believed that God was speaking to her and had told her to start an uprising to get the English out of France. By doing so, she pissed off some high-powered Catholics who wanted her gone. So they decided to put her up for trial. But legit, they had no evidence against her. But they were like, whatever, fake it till you make it, right? So they just accused her of heresy with no evidence because... It was a lie. And on top of that, they denied her counsel, which was against the church's rules. They just hated her and wanted to get rid of her. I think there were like 70 plus charges brought up against her. One of them being for wearing men's clothing, in which she was burned at the stake for. In 1431, in front of a crowd of thousands of people, they lit her on fire for wearing male clothing. But it was discovered after her death that she never even did this. Literally, they killed an innocent woman. Why? Because they were probably intimidated by her. We are now 
now at our fifth and halfway mark with the slaying of women. Pope Innocent VII wasn't innocent at all. In fact, he was terrified of witches. He said that they were real and a huge threat. So he created a huge witch hunt. He dispatched his men to Germany to try witches. And due to the pressure he put on them, countless innocent women were killed after being accused of being witches. All because Pope Innocent was paranoid as hell. Not only that, but in 1487 a book was written all about these witches. It said that this book promoted burning them at the stake and that influenced a number of killings. Plus, the book was just filled with lies, like saying these women would stop cows from producing milk and would ride on broomsticks in the air. It's just truly messed up and spread misinformation and paranoia. In our fourth spot, we have the burning of the dead. Apparently, the church holds grudges because 43 years after John Wycliffe passed away, they had his body dug up and burned. Now, let me explain how it got to this point. So, John saw fault in the Roman Catholic Church and saw how it was corrupt. So, he believed that people should worship God and Jesus according to the Bible, not according to the popes and their bishops and priests, because people are corrupt. But the Bible is not. He also believed that people should interpret the Bible for themselves and not how other people tell them to interpret it. Well, the church did not like this at all. So when he passed away, they ordered all his books to be burned. They also ordered for his body to be unburied. And for some reason, it took them years to get this all done. So 43 years later, his body was finally unburied and then torched and then his ashes were just thrown into the river. In our third spot, we have the misuse of power. Just this year, it was discovered that the French clergy had taken advantage of over 200,000 young individuals since the 1950s. It is absolutely disgusting. The height of this happened between the 1950s to the 1970s. That's when most of the cases were discovered. Then there was a resurgence of cases in the early 1990s. And obviously the Catholic Church doesn't want anyone to know about this. In fact, it's obvious that the church was turning a blind eye to the perpetrators. They were more focused on protecting themselves and their reputation. They did not care for the victims at all. A report said, and I quote, the Catholic Church's immediate reaction was to protect itself as an institution and it has shown complete, even cruel indifference to those having suffered abuse. Like I said, it's absolutely disgusting. Moving on to number two, we have the number of priests. In January of 2002, it was discovered that 234 priests have had allegations of sexual misconduct made against them in the last 50 years. You heard me, 234. That just makes me sick to my stomach. These individuals are using their title and control to take advantage of others. Some of the victims did file lawsuits against a number of dioceses and got multiple million dollar settlements in some cases. But that still does not take away their trauma and their PTSD. Even though the Catholic Church held a worldwide summit to talk about all this, it wasn't that effective as priests were still caught taking advantage of individuals years later. Starting off this countdown, we have the nuns. In 2019, Pope Francis for the first time addressed the horrors that happened to nuns in the Catholic Church. Priests and bishops and other church officials have been taking advantage of nuns for ages. This was an ongoing problem for years and the church wasn't doing anything about it. They were too busy focusing on covering up even bigger scandals and issues. Over the years, more and more nuns have come forward saying that they were victims. Some were afraid to speak up because they were dependent on the church and literally couldn't leave. Although Pope Francis acknowledged what happened, it's unclear the steps they are taking to prevent it in the future. In our ninth spot today, we have the Knights Templar. So Philip IV of France, as well as the Catholic Church, are directly responsible for torturing and executing innocent individuals back in the 14th century. Basically, Philip did not like the Templars in Spain and wanted to get rid of them. So he sent out his men to round them up, arrest them, and then imprison them. He then accused the innocent men of terrible crimes like sodomy, heresy, and renouncing Christ. Any of those crimes were punishable by the death penalty. Again, they were innocent, he just wanted to get rid of the Templar order. He then would torture the Templars so that they would confess. He would use a rack to stretch out their shoulders until they dislocated. Or he would have their private parts smashed. 
This was all done while the church knew that the men were innocent. In our eighth spot, we have Pope Pius XII. In this case, it's what the church didn't do. According to a recent discovery of archives, Pope Pius XII was fully aware what the Nazis were doing during the Holocaust and chose to remain silent. He knew of the mass executions of the Jewish individuals and he dismissed this all. In fact, he said that they were unable to confirm the crimes, so that's why he didn't speak up against them. It says a lot when they refused to publicly condemn the Nazis. In fact, apparently his silence was so that the Germans didn't come for them, so that the church could always be successful. They were just caring about themselves and not about the thousands of innocent individuals being killed. Moving on to number 7, we have the violent murders. Back in 1095, Pope Urban II gave rise to the Crusades during his reign as the head of the Catholic Church. He called all Christians in Europe to go to war against the Muslims. And it was not pretty. It literally said that they killed so many Muslims that the street ran with blood. And this was only the beginning. Waves of crusades continued until 1396, and although Catholics were not the only religion involved in mass violence, Pope Urban got it all started. And it was a violent time to say the least. Everyone was killed, no matter their age. Some people's heads were even put on sticks and then they would carry them around to scare others. Like that is hella messed up. In our sixth spot today we have William Tyndale. During the 16th century, William took it upon himself to translate the Bible into vernacular English so that more people were able to read it. But for some reason, the Catholic Church did not like him doing this. Which is weird. Wouldn't they want the Bible translated so more people would become followers of it? Anyways, William actually had to go into hiding because the church was coming for him. They even burned copies of the Bible that were being smuggled around Europe. In the end, William was captured, tried for heresy, and then burned at the stake. He literally did nothing wrong. Want to know something even more messed up? Years later, the church was like, ah yes, let's translate the Bibles. They then turned to William's translations and used a whole lot of it. And then they never even apologized. It, ridiculous. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Pope Alexander VI. So, uh, Pope Alexander VI was uh, said to be one of the worst popes in history. Why? Well, he is known for something known as the Banquet of Chestnuts. He basically invited 50 women over and told them to strip for him. Then he threw chestnuts on the floor and forced the women to get on their hands and knees and just surround their feet like animals. To make matters worse, he told the men that he invited that he would give the man who could get it on with the most women jewelry or fine clothes. So then they were all fighting over these women. This guy was hella corrupt and sick. Not only that, but he liked to watch horses get it on. That is disgusting. In our fourth spot today, we have the cover-ups. So a lot of shady stuff has gone down with the Catholic Church. There's no denying that. For years, the church knew all about the scandals surrounding the leaders of the church and how they would take advantage of innocent individuals, but they kept brushing this issue under the rug. Then in 2001, the Vatican told them that any cases should be reported directly to the Vatican hierarchy. Years later, they still weren't dealing with any of these cases. In 2004, instead of getting rid of the priests in question, they just moved them to different churches or different countries. So that didn't really stop them. They just had a new set of people that they could take advantage of. They literally cared more about their priests than the victims. Moving on to number three, we have the grooming. Over the years, people of power at the church have groomed a number of young individuals. Today, I'm sharing the story of Michael. When he was young, he was groomed and forced into doing things he didn't want to do. One of the brothers of the church would bring him to Broadway shows and movies. This was all part of the grooming process. Then when he entered the congregation of Christian brothers, that's when he was abused and groomed by four or five different men. This is absolutely disgusting. And of course, the church would do any and everything to make sure Michael's story or others didn't get out. In our second spot, we have the funding. CBC News and the Globe and Mail recently obtained files that expose the Catholic Church for spending some of the $79 million that it agreed to pay residential school survivors. That's right. 
They spent money that was meant to go to survivors of their residential schools. But instead, they took most of that money and put it into things like their Bible study group or for their personal lawyers and unapproved loans. Whereas other churches, including the Anglican, United, and Presbyterian Church, paid the full amount of compensation owed to the survivors without an issue. But the Catholic Church took the money and used it for themselves, which is disgusting since they played the biggest role in residential schools and the horrors that took place there. And in our number one spot today, we have the unmarked grades. Earlier this year, thousands of unmarked graves have been found by residential schools across Canada. Residential schools were funded by the federal government and run by the churches. They would tear families apart, taking the children and forcing them into these schools in order to assimilate them, and they were stripped of their native language and culture and traditions. While in the schools, they were treated terribly. They were neglected, tortured, and even murdered. In these unmarked graves, thousands of innocent young individuals were found. This went on for 120 years. Tens of thousands of indigenous children were sent to these schools. Thousands never returned home. Currently, the grounds are being searched for unmarked graves at the Mohawk Institute. And soon, more and more residential school grounds will be explored. And sadly, we all know more bones are going to be unearthed. It's a very sad and tragic reality. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have St. Michael's Church in Dublin. This may be a church surrounded by the artsy urban setting of Dublin, but if you go deep, deep inside the church, you will find mummies. Yep. Mummies. Its limestone vaults keep the air dry, which makes it the perfect holding area for preserving them. The church was built in 1095. Yep, old. And it is said to have likely been a temple burial site before it became a church. To paint a picture of the crypts of the church, they of course have stone walls, are extremely dusty, and they're filled with coffins. And probably the devil is hiding behind them. Cute story time. When my brother was young, he saw a poster of The Mummy, the movie, and he said to my dad, Dad, what about the daddies? And that's what I think about every time someone brings up mummies. Ah, my brain. Coming up in our number ninth spot today, we have the Duomo of Cosenza, Italy. We were bound to have one church from Italy in here, as, well, Italy is seemingly only churches. I did a bus tour throughout the country, so I would know. This is a church in an ancient part of Italy, and it is so old, that nobody knows when it was built. You would think that archaeologists would be on that and figure it out by this point, but as such, they haven't figured it out quite yet. Probably because it is haunted. Dun dun dun. By Satan himself. The church became a cathedral around 1184, and its architecture is supposed to be a sight to see. The church also has many burials on site and is home to the bones of its first priest. Humans are fascinating. Do you ever think about why we keep the bones of something that once was in a box and then put under the earth so that we can visit the place where it was buried every year, even though we can't see it? It's just a solution for our mind to be at peace with the concept of death. We're just fascinating. Okay, moving on to our next terrifying church. In the number eight spot, we have the Church of the Assumption of Our Lady, Guadajara, Mexico. But don't be fooled. It may look old and terrifying from the outside, but it is just as old and terrifying from the inside. However, it does have one really cool aesthetic that all the other churches are jealous of. On the perfect time of day, when the sun hits it on its right angle, the church's bricks seem to glow with a fiery orange just representing the depths of hell itself. I'm just joking. Inside its walls, it has neo-gothic vaults with impressive artwork from the modern and late medieval period. But it also has a beautiful collection of mummies on display. Among the bodies is a child who was killed for converting to Catholicism in the 1700s. There have been many people over the years that have claimed to see her eyes blink and her hair move. Not terrifying at all. Coming up in our seventh spot today, we have the St. Thomas Anglican Parish of Mulgua, New South Wales, Australia. Yeah, this church reminds me of your classic horror movie church. Small, old, and just downright creepy. This church has a very dark history and continues to creep its locals and visitors alike. There is a legend that has two boys who died in a fire in the bell tower after a prank went horribly wrong. Since then, it is said that any kind of light angers the spirit of these boys. There have been many reports of lights going on and off, even including the lights of cars going on and off as drivers 
just pass by the site. I wish I lived close to this place so I could try this out because this sounds like a ghost hunter's gold mine. Coming up in our sixth spot today, we have St. Andrews on the Red in Selkirk, Canada. This is the oldest church in Western Canada and was created in 1831, which compared to the St. Mikan's Church created in 1095, it's not that old. But nevertheless, the devil may still house this creepy landmark. It is said that both the church and its graveyard are filled with restless spirits that had died from tuberculosis and many varieties of the influenza. It's also the resting place of a lot of the earlier settlers and HBC officers. Visit at your own risk. In our fifth spot today, we have St. Michael's Chapel in Hallstatt, Austria. A beautiful church surrounded by a truly spectacular view of the mountains and an alpine lake. But inside, you will find the largest collection of painted human skulls. I'm sorry, come again, Melissa? The largest collection, which means there are other collections out there. What on earth made someone look at a skull and think, yes, yes, I think I should paint this. Just why? Someone out there is thinking, because art. This is also a chapel that was made during a time when Catholics believed that they had to be buried in a consecrated ground so that they could rise from their graves when the end of the earth came. Were they predicting a future apocalypse, AKA Walking Dead style? Hopefully, not hopefully. <laughs> But since this was such a popular need, the graveyard actually became quite crowded. And so, as a result, naturally, they decided that the solution of storing bones for religious displays was a viable solution. As for the person who decided that painting those bones would be fun and aesthetically pleasing to see, we have no name. Satan sounds like a good name to me. In our fourth spot today, we have St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Key West, Florida. This beautiful white church may look sparkly and alluring from the outside, but you should know better by now. It's only so new because it's been rebuilt so many times, because it is cursed. The site was once a seminal burial ground, and then the land was privately owned by the Fleming family before the church was built. It became a church as a result of the Fleming widow being assured that her husband's remains that were buried on the land would not be disturbed. But of course, that promise was broken, and as a result, the ghost of John Williams Charles Fleming still haunts the site. I would have thought that it would be her that would haunt the site since it was her promise that was broken, but Maybe that's just me. Coming up in our third spot today, we have the Norwich Cathedral in England. Built in the year 1096, this church has a very gothic but yet Romanesque look. The area around this church is almost a thousand years old, and as you can imagine, there have probably been a lot of ups and downs within these years. As a result of such a turbulent history, it is believed that there are many spirits wandering the surroundings. Some believe it to be previous bishops and priests, and possibly nuns. And some believe it to be people who were burned at the stake. Personally, I I think it's the latter. If I were burned at the stake, you better believe I'm coming back to haunt you. Gosh, I'm so glad to be living in 2022. In our second spot today, we have the Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Known for having the finest architecture in Scotland, the church was founded in the 15th century. There are many ghostly legends surrounding this church, including the White Lady, who was believed to have been cursed by an evil spirit and is waiting for her knight to save her. People have said to have seen a barking dog spirit and the ghost of many monks walking around. People that have worked on the building, especially in the crypt, have vowed to never work there ever again. So that's saying a lot. I mean, if I were going to pick a place that I would think the devil would be wandering in, huh? This would be it. Finally, in our first spot today, we have a personal favorite of mine, the Church of Our Lady Before Tin in Prague, Czech Republic. Or more commonly known as the Devil's Church. Yep, if that doesn't tell you everything, then I'm not sure what to tell you. I have actually personally visited this church and the underground of this church, and I have to say, it is truly anxiety provoking. <laughs> this church is a beautiful landmark in the center of Old Town Prague. Created in the 14th century, its look is quite the reflection of the times. Intimidating. Inside its walls are altar paintings and old Baroque designs. But of course, it is also the home to many tombs and burials and dark secrets. Some say many brutal killings and hangings have happened in and around this church makes you ask the age-old question, what is the point of worshipping the Bible if you ain't gonna practice its teachings? <laughs> 
humans are a mystery to me. Number 10, the Duomo Florence, Italy. This is one of the coolest places I've ever been and I had to put it on this list. I've been to Italy once in my life and this was the highlight of the trip for me and I did not expect it to be because I was like, oh, this is a really beautiful church and then I was like, whoa, living Assassin's Creed and it was amazing. Besides living out your Assassin's Creed Ezio dreams, not only is the cathedral stunning, but the trip to the top is nothing like you'd expect. I walked in expecting to solely marvel at the frescoes immediately inside, which are breathtaking, but then there was a guy by a small door where you could pay to travel the 463 steps it takes to get to the top. I'm not the one to skip a leg day, so challenge accepted. It wasn't just a spiral staircase, which honestly, thank goodness, because I would have, huh. but anyways, it was that plus scaling steep, narrow pathways and traveling through narrow tunnels. Whoever pictured monks as rounded and out of shape was dead wrong, especially if they were climbing that every day. Number nine, the Bronston Goddess. You would expect statues of the Virgin Mary and Jesus to be present in churchyards and chapels, but this little stone sculpture isn't really as self-explanatory. In the 1920s, in Bronston and Rutland, their All Saints Church front steps needed replacing. As they removed the stones, they came across this strange little sculpture. With two noses, a tongue sticking out, protruding breasts and bulging eyes, no one could quite place who or what it was supposed to be. Some believe it's a medieval guardian sculpture to frighten off evil spirits or some kind of malicious monarch depiction or even a pagan deity, but the style of carving doesn't match anything previously known, so it could be anything and remains a mystery to this day. Number eight, the devil's footprints. Ooh. One night, the devil himself, for whatever reason, tried to steal the bell from the tower of St. Dave's Church in Lenarth. A vicar, however, awoke to the noise and chased the fiend into the graveyard and the man's foot ignited a fiery footprint on the stone before he left. A similar case befell St. Mary's Churchyard in Newington, Kent, but this time the devil succeeded in stealing the bells. I don't know what it is about the devil and bells, he just loves them, he wants them for himself. The devil leapt from the tower with the bells in a bag and left a fire footprint on a stone before he left. He accidentally dropped the bells into a stream in his escape and a local witch said that in order to retrieve them, they'd need four pure white cows. When they found the cows, the cows seemed to be doing the job until an onlooker was like, look, there's a black dot on one of them. And then, then the bells went back into the stream because they weren't pure white. But you can actually visit the stone with said footprint atop it, and it is said that if you place a finger on top and walk around it three times, it will bring you good luck. Better luck than the devil had at least, he just couldn't get a handle on those bells. Number seven, St. Catherine of Siena's head. There's gonna be a lot of heads on this list. So get ready for a lot of head puns. Out of all the heads we are going to discuss today, Catherine, Catherine's looks the best. Like she's got some kind of secret to the whole like decomposition thing. Like she looks pretty good. When she was just seven years old, Catherine had visions that led her to pursue a life in the church with fervor. Her family tried to marry her off, so she cut her hair and scalded her body and ran off to become a nun. When she joined the nunnery, she had a powerful vision of Jesus placing a ring made of his skin, the flesh that was removed during his circumcision, which was revered at the time for some reason, and claimed Catherine in marriage. For the rest of her life, Catherine claimed that she could always see the flesh ring on her finger. Her miracles included levitating during prayer and receiving stigmata, which are holy bodily marks. She died in Rome, but people in Siena, her hometown, wanted a part of her there. So they went to Rome and stole her head. When the guards caught them, they prayed to Catherine, and when the guards looked in the bag, it was entirely filled with rose petals. When the guards left, the head returned, and it is said that that was her final miracle. They also have a piece of her thumb, which isn't mentioned in the story, but I assume that turned into a rose petal as well. Number six, the tongue and jaw of Saint Anthony. Have you ever seen an 800 year old tongue? Do you want to? Well, you're in luck. Okay, so we've talked about heads being prized, but this church decided to go ahead and covet something else instead. St. Anthony was known for giving terrific and captivating sermons all across Italy and France that seemed to have a unique pull to them. Due to his work in life, Anthony was canonized after his death, but it took 30 years for his body to be exhumed and buried in a new basilica. It 
was then that they discovered that his tongue and jaw looked miraculously like it hadn't decomposed a single day. So they buried the rest of his body and put the jaw and tongue in a sacred display case. Saint Anthony is the saint of lost things and people go there to pray to him that they will find what they've lost. Hopefully Anthony doesn't feel like he lost anything when he, they took his tongue. The Church of Transfiguration. This church is interesting not because of what you may find inside it, but because of what you won't. Should you choose to visit Kizzy Island, you may want to spend some time at the Church of Transfiguration to marvel at the architecture and learn more about the unique way it was built. The church was entirely constructed out of wood and does not include a single nail or screw. The entire church is holding itself together through a series of intricately placed interlocking logs. Now, some when they think of that would be picturing like a simple log cabin kind of thing, but no, it's incredibly intricate and features rounded teardrop domes and fine points. So what an incredible architectural feat. Number four, St. John's head, another one. Imagine having a head everyone wants to get their hands on. Like just imagine being that person. This object, it sounds weird to be calling it an object. Anyways, this weird preserved head has been found in several places across the globe. And unless St. John the Baptist had several heads, it can't all be the real thing. And also, how did you even find it? But the most famous places you can go to decide for yourself are the Basilica of St. Sylvester the First in Rome, or the Sedens Church in Munich, Germany. Both claim to have the head on display for all to see of the legendary John the Baptist. Except in Rome, they've chosen to serve it up on a silver platter, while in Munich, they've cloaked it in fine fabric and jewels. The head also appears in Damascus in a mosque also covered by fabric. So I don't know, maybe the skull takes turns? Who knows? Okay, we're getting to our top three guys. If you like this video, you know what to do. Remember to like, comment, subscribe because it helps us out and we love you for it. And also it lets us know we're doing a good job. Number three, the head of Oliver Plunkett. Here is yet another church that's ahead of its game. Oliver Plunkett was an Irish Catholic Archbishop who died as a martyr and was the last in fact during the Popish plot. Long story short, when Henry VIII left the church, centuries of strife followed between the Catholics and the Protestants, which led to the alleged Popish plot. A rumored alleged plot by the Catholics to kill Charles II and put his Catholic brother James on the throne. Whether or not the plot was actually real, no one knows. Either way, Oliver Plunkett was arrested, drawn and quartered in 1681, and remains one of the most famous Catholic figures in Ireland to this day. After his death, his head was first brought to Rome and hidden in 1921, and now sits in St. Peter's Church in Drogheda, Ireland. He's got a scorch mark on his face because apparently someone tried to burn the head before it was saved by his friends. So it's, it's there, you can see it, and there's only one of them this time. Number two, the Sinead Chapel. So yes, today we are covering weird things found in churches, but what about churches found inside weird things? Located in Alouvi, Belfast in northern France is a church inside an oak tree. Chenet Chapel aka Chapel Oak as it translates to honestly looks like a church designed for a scene in a Tim Burton film. The oak tree is over 800 years old and legend says that William the Conqueror chose this tree to pray beneath before he left for England. When lightning hit the tree in the 17th century, it sealed the tree's fate as becoming a place of worship. There is an entire spiral staircase that surrounds the tree with two tiny chapels inside. It was later converted to a temple of reason to save it from French revolutionary atheists who tried to burn it down. But today it remains and you can still visit it today. You can still visit it today either to pray or marvel at the spectacle. It's up to you. Number one, Basilica of St. Ursula. A church? made of bones. A sign of respect to a group of women made martyrs when they arrived in Rome. Basilica of St. Ursula in Cologne is the largest mosaic made from human body parts and according to legend, they include the bones of an English princess named Ursula. St. Ursula lived somewhere between 300 to 600 AD and decided to go on a pilgrimage in Europe. But given the time as well as the fact that she was a princess, she could not travel alone. So she took a force of a thousand virgin women with her. Their ship allegedly blew across the sea to Rome in a single day, but then another ambitious wind swept them off course to Cologne. Unfortunately for Ursula and her league, the Huns were ravaging Europe at that time and were captured shortly into their journey. The elegant way of saying what happened is to say that they were martyred, so we'll say that. Relics of the princess were housed in the basilica, but in the middle ages a pit of bones were discovered. The bones were believed to be those of the princess and her followers and they were placed within the church so that they may find 
finally be at rest. Unfortunately, due to forensic analysis, the bones also include men, dogs, and babies. So I guess there are a lot of questions here that need answers. So if they're not St. Ursula's, whose are they? Mm -hmm.